Besides a high vacuum chamber like this, the most important tool needed to make computer chips at home is some kind of setup to do photolithography. This uses light to write nanoscale features onto a chip. I'm going to talk about this machine that I built, which uses a modified DLP projector to make things like the first homemade chips, the world's smallest QR code, and these lines, which are astonishingly only a few thousand atoms wide. Before I talk about this mess of cobbled together parts, I'd like to try to blow your mind using Google Maps. Nanofabrication is incredible, but it's inherently on a scale that we can't imagine because it's so far out of place from our everyday lives. Humans lose the intuition for reasoning at these extremely small and large scales, but at the very least we can be impressed by the precision involved here. When you get a chance, open up Google Earth and try something. In rough order of magnitude terms, if a silicon wafer were the size of the Earth, then the chips on that wafer would have features with the same resolution as what you're looking at. This is nuts, and it gives you an idea of why the images that describe the layers in a modern chip can be hundreds of gigabytes in size. The amount of information stored in the design alone on a modern chip is mind-blowing. You can start with a zoomed-out globe view of the Earth, slowly going into some random spot, and take note of the immense magnification that's required to see any kind of features on the terrain of the Earth. This is the same magnification you need to look at the transistors in a chip. The analogy might be a bit of a stretch, but I still think it's a useful mental image to have. Very cool, Sam. Thank you. I said that we would talk about my home-built lithography stepper, so let's do that and then I'll give you a quick demo. The idea is super simple. We start with a 1080p DLP projector from Amazon. We modify the optics a little bit so that instead of making a rapidly diverging beam that projects onto an entire wall, we make the beam converge into a small spot that's focused through modified uh, microscope so we can use an objective lens to further focus that onto the wafer where this cheese it is sitting. The wafer is scanned in X and Y with this image that's projected onto it and the motion of the stage is synced up to the image that's being projected. So we can expose a large field throughout the entire wafer, even if the microscope objective only projects an image that's a few square millimeters. Making smaller features and thus higher resolution is literally as simple as changing the microscope objective to one with more magnification. Up into a point, obviously, this cannot go on forever. The XY stage is closed loop. There's these glass scales or linear optical encoders, whatever you want to call them, so I know exactly where the stage is. It's just driven with these stepper motors and planetary reduction gear sets and then a lead screw, so there's tons of backlash, but that's not a huge problem. If your system's closed looped and you're mostly only doing static positioning, then you can kind of null out the backlash with that closed loop system. The table can be jogged manually with these joysticks for alignment. And when you're doing an actual exposure, there's some LabVIEW software that controls everything. I know, I should have done it in Python or C or something, but I made this when I was like a junior in high school, so give me a break. I'll talk about the optics modifications to the projector and all this other stuff, but let's do a demo. Okay, let's get everything ready. We need some photoresist so we can spin it onto the wafer and make it light sensitive. Then we need a hot plate that's warmed up to about 100 degrees C to bake that layer on and drive off the solvents. We need a spin coating apparatus and then the wafer. Put about half a mil of photoresist onto the wafer, then we spin it at 4000 RPM for about a minute. That yields a 1 or 2 micron thick film, which we can bake on that hot plate. I'll carry that wafer over to the stepper and place it on the sample stage. We don't need to use the vacuum chuck right now because we're just kind of messing around. This isn't a precision exposure. For lack of a better test image, I have my laptop hooked up to the projector with my Twitter profile pulled up. I'll also expose a resolution test image for a more scientific experiment. You'll notice that image through the eyepiece is red and we want to expose it with UV light. So to start the exposure, I just pull out this UV blocking filter that appears red, of course. I'm using a positive photoresist, so after exposure, we're ready to go ahead and develop it so we can see the image and then etch it into this silicon surface or whatever we want to do later. If you're using a negative photoresist, that is, the exposed parts become less soluble in the developer and stay behind, then a post-exposure bake is required, just an extra step in there, but we don't have to do that. So we go right over to develop in a couple percent potassium hydroxide solution for about 40 seconds. After the wafers develop, we can stick it in a microscope and see how it worked. This is a standard resolution test image that came out really well. It's about 100 microns wide, so you can imagine how tiny those features are in the center. The only problem is the bottom left is slightly underdeveloped and the top right is slightly overexposed. The Twitter profile came out far worse. This is because grayscale lithography is really difficult. Also, there's a reason why the bottom left came out pretty terrible comparatively to the rest of the image. In the beginning, when I built this machine, everything came out looking like this, and it was terrible. 
But if you've seen any of the exposures I've done recently on my website or wherever, they look almost perfect and are a whole lot better than this. It turns out that for some reason, the projector's exposure field is not uniform. There were bright and dark spots across it. The secret to getting this to work was just to place a webcam at the wafer's point of view to take an image of a blank white screen being projected, and then use that to generate a calibration mask that I can apply to subsequent images to kind of correct for the projector not being optimal. So that's essentially how the whole thing works. Now I'll go over some of the quirks my system has and the tricks I had to do to get this whole optical system working. First thing you notice is that the projector is not shining down perpendicular to the wafer. It's actually at a bit of an angle. The DLP chip and optics inside of these projectors are angled up at about 11 to 13 degrees so they project up onto a screen. And these can be like sitting on the floor and you can watch a movie on the wall. So you have to find that angle and then build a bracket to hold it so that the image shoots straight down. The inside of the projector is mostly stock with some important modifications. First of all, I've removed the color wheel, which normally sits in here, and it attenuates quite a lot of the ultraviolet going through this path. We want to get as much UV shooting down through here and exposing onto the wafer as possible to keep the exposure times low. When you remove the color wheel, you normally have to add some little circuit into your projector to fool the main board into thinking it's still running this motor. Normally there's a photodiode that clocks out the RPM of that motor so it can sync up the red, green, and blue frames. Obviously there's no spinning part, so we have to generate that photodiode signal and reproduce it. These projectors contain a mercury vapor arc lamp, which spews out tons of ultraviolet and is perfect for this sort of thing, but normally they have about a one inch square of glass in front of them that blocks most of the UV coming out for the safety of the viewer, so you don't go completely blind when you accidentally step in front of this. It's also, it has two purposes. It's, it blocks the ultraviolet, but it's also what is known as a hot mirror in that it reflects the heat back into the body of the lamp and then it reduces the amount of heat going into the optical train so it won't melt the rest of the projector. So you have to replace that with a UV pass hot mirror. These can be bought really inexpensively from like Thor Labs or Edmund Optics or somewhere. I've kind of hacked that on there with a the Dremel. After that, you can start to estimate the exposure time that it'll take to expose a wafer. Normally, photoresists have a dosage of about 100 to 200 millijoules per square centimeter. The intensity of UV lamp are rated with units of milliwatts per square centimeter. If you cross out all of your units and divide those numbers, you're left with only seconds, and that number tells you the required exposure to get the expected dose. Next thing is the projection lens, some optics here with the optional XYZ table I just threw on here for fine adjustment, and then of course the microscope objective. You can take the stock projection lens from the microscope, flip it around, and it'll make a tiny image, maybe a few millimeters wide, a couple inches from the front of the projector, and that'll work great for chip stuff. I wanted a little more flexibility, so I did not flip that projection lens around. I've just spaced it out of these M2.5 standoffs. Then I'm using two optics inside of this, which gives me fine adjustment, and that allows me to precisely set the focal point somewhere within the microscope body to accept the image into the microscope objective. The fine adjustment makes this all quite a bit easier. The optics in here attenuate quite a lot of ultraviolet, but it's okay, we have a lot of headroom now that we've modified this projection lens. These are just macro lens adapters from Amazon. They're meant to thread onto the front of a normal camera lens and allow you to focus to something much, much closer. In our case, using two of them kind of doubles the effect and it allows the rapidly diverging beam from the, from the projection lens to be collimated and focused to a beam that converges somewhere within the microscope body. Simulation can be useful here, but you don't really know the parameters of cheap lenses you buy. So I found the best way is just to kind of hold everything in place with hot glue or build little jigs and test out your ideas until it works. If you want to experiment with stuff like this at home, it's not necessary to go this overboard and make a professional lithography stepper. My first prototypes were a lot sketchier and just involved shooting an unmodified projector right into the camera or eyepiece port of a microscope. And that gets you pretty decent results actually. So I'd really encourage you to mess with this and have fun with it, even if you have no intention on building a complete rigid setup like this. Anyway, that's all I have. And as always, I hope you enjoyed watching the video and hopefully you learned something too.